in terms of special types of species that exist, we actually give certain groups of species special designations just to make them feel better about themselves. The first are what we call foundation species. And these are the ones that are going to start an ecosystem, start the community. Typically, when you think of these, they're who show up. They can be who show up first. They're also sometimes called pioneers. And the big ones that we usually like to think of are things like lichen. The lichens show up, then we start getting plants. Once you have lichens and plants, we can now have insects, so on and so forth. So foundation species, they're just ones that are going to start off the party. It is measuring my voice. Yes, it is. Yay. So we have those. Those are important. We have all these classifications. So we have producers and consumers and the decomposers and the detritivores and all and saprivores and what have you. We also have what are known as a keystone species. The keystone species are based on the idea of a keystone. So if you were building an archway and you don't have too many modern tools, the way you would build it is you would stack bricks or rocks on top of each other until you have, for the most part, the arch. And then you shove one large stone into the middle of the two. And all the forces end up shoving up against that stone in the middle. And that's what keeps that archway stable. And as long as everything is pushing towards that stone in the middle, it will remain stable. We call that stone at that top that maintains that balance a keystone. So similarly, when we look at any type of community, Keystone species are the ones that maintain the biodiversity. And the elimination of those species equals the elimination of the biodiversity. A really easy example or a thing that you could do is if you go into any type of ecosystem, any type of community, any place where life is dealing with life, and we see all sorts of interactions, we can say, that species right there, whatever it is, sea stars. Sea stars are the keystone of this kelp forest, say. Well, how could we test that? The easiest way is to test what a keystone species is. If you remove it, the biodiversity collapses. So your experiment would be remove the keystone species. And then see the results. If you see one species take over, which is basically a nice way of saying a collapse of the community, yeah, you got rid of the keystone species. So, here, they're looking at Pizaster, which is a sea star. I know you call them starfish. They're not fish, so they're not starfish. It's a star in the ocean, therefore it's a sea star. So, what we can do is we can plot, or what turned out to happen was just a disaster where we had an area where we kept the sea stars, and then we had an area where they were removed. And we just kept track over time. And when you look at the species present, which is a measure or a slight measure of H, again, H being just diversity, what we see is when we have disaster present, we have a lot of species. We remove disaster and the species biodiversity collapses. Conclusion. Pizaster, this type of sea star, is a keystone species. There's another very, very, very famous example of keystone species, and that's otters. Otters turn out to be keystone species. And they are the keystone species for the same reason that sea stars are, Otters and sea stars eat the same 
target organism. You know what it is. They go after urchins. And urchins multiply like crazy, and they will eat everything. So their job is to keep the urchins at bay. They just happen to be ones that we know. But again, how do you find out? You eliminate and you discover. You can't look at an ecosystem and look at a food web and say, oh, clearly, clearly it's this one right here. You, you, you can't look and tell. You have to run the experiment, whether on accident or on purpose, and find out the answer. Then you have the ones that we are partial to. We like what are known as ecosystem manipulators or engineers, if you want to sound smarter. We, we don't manipulate the environment. We engineer the environment, which is a nice way of saying make the ecosystem match us. I don't like that it floods. So we change the environment so it doesn't flood on us as often. I want it to have I want it to flood. So we reroute water so we get the water. Do you name any other species that are engineers? Beavers are a famous one. Do you know any others? Not a blatant statement, but there are examples of ants that engineer. They will build tunnels, they will block things, they will purposefully start cultivating fungi that they want. They will actually manipulate their environment to give them an idealized setting. So there are more than just mammals that will do this. I don't know if I, I don't know if they qualify. I mean, I know that their tongues are weird. Have you ever seen the skull of a woodpecker and see how their tongue, how where their tongue is? Their tongue goes out and it wraps around their skull. The reason why is the tongue, when it when they're pecking, contracts and it holds the skull in place so that their brain doesn't slosh around and they don't like give themselves brain damage. They use their tongue to protect their skulls. Don't believe me? Dr. Google. So change is going to happen. We pointed that out last week. So are is, is there like too much of a good thing? Or is all disturbance and change bad? And it it's kind of, it depends. So change, we're going to classify as a disturbance. We're going to mess with the environment. So we're going to change the environment. How could this happen? Well, this could happen through fire, or floods, or volcanoes, or earthquakes, or some type of storm, whatever. So disturbances are going to happen. You can't avoid them as much as we'd like to. You just can't. The question is, how does that affect the biodiversity? There's a hypothesis referred to as the intermediate disturbance hypothesis that basically says that if you can have a local maximum of disturbances, it leads to the maximum amount of biodiversity. In other words, too few disturbances equals low biodiversity. And too many disturbances equals low biodiversity. But an intermediate number would equal high biodiversity, which 
for those of you who love your calculus, because I know you all do, your first derivative is a zero. We have a local maximum. Yay! We love calculus too. So, if I'm always dis or if I'm always disrupting, nothing is going to get to move on in. We're going to constantly be wiping everything out. So obviously, we wouldn't have high biodiversity. But there's another phenomenon where if we never disturb things, you reach what we call a mature state or a climax community, which is going to be a, in a couple of slides. And that basically is when it's stabilized. This is the ecological version of gentrification. It becomes so bloody expensive that only the rich people who've been there forever when they bought their house for $500 and a tin can can live in that house that now costs $59.5 billion. Because there's been no turnover, and they've just sat on it. But if you can go somewhere in between, we seem to get a maximum in terms of biodiversity. When we plot and track that change, we give it a term, meaning these changes that occur with when we are disturbing the environment, if we plot that change, we call it ecological succession. So this is the change in the environment. Usually this is due to a disturbance. So, primary succession is when we start from scratch. What do I mean by we start from scratch? We have a volcano. Volcano blows its top. We have new land that forms. Congratulations. We are starting from the beginning. We would call that primary succession. We have a lake. The lake has always been filled in, or has always had water in it. We have geologic uplift, or somehow the lake gets drained. And now the bottom that has never been exposed to stuff that's not water is now exposed to land-dwelling things. That would be primary succession. We're starting from the beginning. That is in contrast with what we call secondary succession. Secondary succession is when you bowl over the primary or what was there to begin with. This would be things like fire or a flood. Where there was something there, we just bulldoze it over, and now we're starting again. So it's not the first crack at it, it's the second shot at that using that land. The third shot of using that land. Glacier mowing over some stuff. Which ones are we responsible for? We can do secondary. We don't get to say, uh, Krakatoa, blow your lid again. We, we don't get that type of power. So we cause secondary succession. In part. There was actually a really famous one of these, of secondary succession that was, occurred in real time. So back in my day, when I was young, before the Greys, there was a place in a park called Yosmite, I believe is the way it's pronounced in the original Arabic. So at this Yosmite place, they had a lake called Mirror Lake. And Mirror Lake, which is in the valley, of Yosemite. What happened was they weren't getting enough rainfall, so we had a decrease in precipitation, and we had an increase in sediments, and the result was over the course of like 20, 30 years, Mirror Lake became Mirror 
meadow. And it underwent secondary succession. With all the snow and rain from the last few years, Mirror Lake has returned again. Kind of like Tuolumne Lake, or not uh, Tulare Lake, not Tuolumne Lake, Tulare Lake that you all wrote about. Some of you had some really interesting questions that were really good about like wanting to compare the biodiversity before and after. Those were good ones. Others of you were like, what's the biodiversity? Like, deep, very deep. What we're trying to avoid with ecological succession is we're trying to avoid something referred to as a climax state, which I thought I had in there, but it's in a different talk. A climax state is a mature fill-in-the-blank. A mature forest. Well, what's a mature forest? It's a bunch of several hundred-year-old trees that block out all the light, which means you're not going to get anything new growing there. And since big mature trees are thick, it's going to be harder for our new organisms to come on in and populate the area. You're just going to tend to have the birds that can be there because they can only handle what's you know, in those trees to begin with because there's no bushes, there's no shrubs, there's no grasses because that's all blocked out by those trees, which means you're going to be limited on your other herbivores and carnivores. It's just kind of gentrified. How do you refresh it? Well, we're in California, so the answer is always fire. Burn it down. You burn down those trees, there's sunlight again. And with sunlight equals new growth, which is matching again what we would expect to see. Yay, now let's talk this week. Are you ready for math? You are. Oh, I'm so glad. So this week we're going to talk populations. Well, today we're going to talk populations. Thursday is going to be energy and matter. So we have a few things to deal with and some objectives. Let's talk about growth rates. So when we look at populations, one of the big things that we have to worry about is a growth rate. So what are the things that go, that go into growth rates? We define growth rate as a little r. So that's the symbol that we use, a little r. What we have to take into account are birth rates, meaning the, typically the way that we view it is the number of births per population size, like per 100,000 per year or per month or per whatever. So it's births per amount of population per amount of time. Got it. We like to go per 100,000. I don't know why, but we like just to use 100,000. And usually it's going to be per year or per day. Something that's a little bit easier to define. Because if you say per month, well... The best month of the year kind of gets shortchanged because its length changes and it's the shorter one and you know, all that. So birth rate, we have to know that because that's going to increase the population. Death rate decreases the population or the growth rate. Immigration status or immigration rate, what's an immigrant? Say immigrant, like birth, death, got that. Immigrant, what's an immigrant? It doesn't need to be species. It's an individual who's moving into the area of concern. So what's an immigrant? The one that leaves. You are an immigrant. By definition, you are an immigrant as well. We're just looking at two different locations. Part of my family immigrated to the United States. By emigrating from 
Japan or Russia or Poland or Slovakia or Wales. Where else do I have? Sweden, England. Those are the ones I think I know. Yeah. And even then, there's only one place really where you actually can't make the claim of immigration emigration. There's only one continent where that claim gets to actually properly be made. Y'all know the one continent where there is, properly speaking, if you are really indigenous there, there is no immigrant, there is no emigrant. You are just indigenous. There's only one place on earth where that claim is actually legit. You all don't know? Where are all humans from? Africa. It's the only place where that claim can be made. Everywhere else, if there's a human there, you're an immigrant. Even the indigenous to the Americas are here because they took a trip across the Bering Strait from Russia. Granted, a lot longer ago than, you know, Whitey did. But still, they came over here. They're not indigenous to the Americas. They immigrated too. The only place that we know of where there were no immigrants are parts of Africa. The only place where those two words do not make sense. Which is kind of a weird idea. Anyway, so what we can do is take all of these things and I could calculate R, which would be my birth rate plus my immigration rate minus my death rate, minus my emigration rate. It's easy. I just need to take all those factors into account. And if I do that, I can calculate R. The problem is, I know the number of births after the fact. It's, I look backwards and I can tell you how many births there were last year. I can't tell you how many of the births there are right now. I can tell you what there used to be. I can tell you what the immigration status or the immigration rates were last year, but I can't tell you what they are right now. I can tell you what the death rates are from last year, but I can't tell you what they are right now. I can tell you what the emigration rate was last year, but I can't tell you what it is right now. The problem with this factor is we don't know what it is right now. We only know it for the past. which makes it hard to deal with. So when people are, oh, let's t let me tell you what's going on right now, the answer is you don't know. All you know is the past. You do not know the present. All we can do is guess. And we're not great at guessing trends, especially when we want a number. With that growth rate, we can look at how it's used by how things reproduce. We put all organisms more or less into two categories of how they choose to reproduce. Not how they choose, that's incorrect. How they evolved to reproduce. The first pattern is a great one called semel parity, which is a nice way of saying you get one shot, don't blow it. Have you ever seen what an oct how many eggs an octopus lays, a female octopus? You haven't? Dr. Google, go ahead, look it up. Look up a, a female octopus and her eggs. Look. You let me know how many there are. It's like two or three. That's on the low end. Some push a million. How many times do female octopuses reproduce? Once. Once the eggs start to hatch, what happens to her? She dies. She's a one and done. That's semel parity. 
Summon parity. You get one shot and only one shot at this. After that, death. There are plants that follow that pattern. There are animals that follow that pattern. Some fungi follow that pattern. Some of the massive category of protists will follow that pattern. Bacteria are kind of weird, so let's ignore them. But there's lots of things. It's not just like, a, oh, this type of animal does this, or this type of plant does this. It's, it's a big, it's a reproductive strategy. The other option is called idioparity, like iteration, repeat over and over again. So these ones, you get many shots at it. The catch with iteroparity is if you compare the numbers per round of reproduction, they're a lot smaller than they are with semilparity. I mean, you can still make a lot, but it's not as many as the one and done. It's still a smaller amount per round. Which one is better? The answer is they both are surviving, so they both work. Got it. We give them names based upon this reproductive strategy. So rather than saying semel parity, because it kind of sounded a little bit pretentious like that, we say that this one is based upon trying to get out as many numbers as possible. You're hoping for the maximum number of them can make it. That is what we would call an R strategist. They're going for flood the market with as many as we have and hope they all, as many of them make it. So they are trying to maximize that number and that number. They're hoping for the best. The other option, those iteroparists, are what we refer to, and this doesn't make sense yet, but it's called a K strategist. This is a long term game for them. What they're trying to do is minimize the death rate and the emigration rate. They're playing to different sides of growth. And we'll deal with what the K means in a moment. R makes sense. K is kind of weird. Usually, yeah. If you look at that thing right there, we gave it a name last week. Do you remember? Did I use it with you all, or am I thinking of a different class? I'm now thinking of a different class. I think I told it in a different class. It's called an inflorescence. Did I drop that word with you all? No? Okay. Yay. New, but, new uh, plant word. That's called an inflorescence. An inflorescence is the part of a plant that contains the reproductive parts. Meaning, that's where the flowers are found. In some plants, they will always, or they'll continuously produce the flowers, and some they don't. But if you actually look, even then you notice patterns. Like if you look at these flowers back here, these plants. If you notice, it's for the most part just leaves. But then you'll see like its own separate stalk where the flowers are. You probably never noticed that. If you look, there seems to be stalks for leaves, and then there's a separate one for where the flowers are. That one that has the flowers, that's an inflorescence. If, like, if you know what the Huntington Library is or Long Beach State, every seven or to ten years, they'll cart out a big old plant of theirs called the corpse flower, and they want to show off that they have a corpse flower and it's not dead yet. Have you ever seen a corpse flower? So they're about 10 feet tall. 
They do not smell like a corpse. I have smelled corpses. They do not smell like a corpse. They smell like wet dogs in like summertime. So like, like it's not death, but it's a take a shower. Like you, you need to take a bath. That's what they smell like. So the thing that you stare at when you look at a corpse flower, everyone's like, oh, look at that big flower. It's not a flower. What you're staring at, that thing that's 9, 10 feet tall, is the inflorescence. And it's covered in the flowers all over it. So you're looking at hundreds, if not thousands, of flowers on a large stalk that's called the inflorescence. So little side note. So if you look at plants, like you can look out there, you can see little bundles at the bottom, the florets. And then you'll notice like there's like this dead little branch thing sticking out of it. That's telling you that plant has already tried to reproduce because that dead stalky thing is the inflorescence. So pay attention to the plants when you walk around them. That's what it is. That's, that's the inflorescence. So how do all things reproduce? The main strategy that everything will follow is referred to as exponential growth. Yay! It's calculus. What this requires to have exponential growth is unlimited resources. Remind me of the resources. I'll start you. Food. Space, shelter. Food, shelter, and space. Eats up everything. So if you have comparatively lots of food, shelter, and space, nothing's stopping you. Have as many babies as you want. Have all the reproduction that you can. The way we mathematically describe it outside of a graph is we describe it in this form which is terrifying. We refer to this as a differential equation. Who's taken a class where you've been taught about these? Would you love it if I had on your first test derived that? You could if you had to. I would structure it to tell you, okay, now do this, now do this, now do this. You could. I won't. It might be an extra credit. I might do that as an extra credit of derive for me, you know, the population over time. So what this equation here says, for those of you who haven't taken math to make you uh, hate existence, what I just highlighted there is the rote, is the rote, is the rate of change. It's how the population changes over time. The way that we can describe how that population changes over time is based upon the population and its growth rate. And that's it. What does that mean? The bigger the population, the faster it grows. The end. That's all it means. This equation here is if I wanted to graph it or make predictions. So it's not the equation that we would use to describe the growth. It's if I want to make a graph. Because typically we want the rate of change, not what the number actually is. If I want to know what the number actually is, I have other techniques I can use. So as we look at these two pictures here, for one, we have it as 1.0n, meaning the growth rate is whatever the population is. So if you start out with a population of 5, the next generation is going to gain 5. So that means the next generation has 10. So its growth rate is now going to be, we add 10. Now we have 10 plus 
5, so that gives us 15. So the next generation, we're going to add 15. That brings us up to 25. So next generation, we're going to add 25. And then we just keep adding whatever that is over and over again. The second one here is going to be half of it. But notice, it still ends up shooting up. So when we have these, we have a, a bottom portion that we call a lag phase. Then we get the exponential growth. Sometimes instead of saying exponential growth, we'll say log growth. Just to terrify you, because logarithms and exponents are related to each other, so we can swap words back and forth if we need to. So what things go through exponential growth? Bacteria, definitely. What else? Humans, good job, yes. What else? Cats, that's right, yes. Shoes in your closet. Yes, that's right. Uh-huh. How about elephants? Can elephants undergo exponential growth? Of course they can. Exponential growth has nothing to do with the organism. Exponential growth has to do with do you have all the food, shelter, and space you need? If the answer is yes, you are a candidate for exponential growth. Period. Full stop. Mic drop. Burn it. Burn the mother down. Whatever. Thanks for laughing at the old person. It was my uh, birthday. You know, I went to Disneyland for my birthday. The problem is my birthday also landed on this year yeah and at disneyland it used to be once upon a time ago so lunar new year so once upon a time ago if you wanted to go to disneyland you went in january february or march and it was empty you could do whatever you wanted disney realized that and they said we don't like that anymore so then they added the new year festival because they know that in Southern California, we have a lot of people who fall and celebrate the Lunar New Year. And the result is, now it's miserable and crowded to go. So it used to be really nice to go on my birthday, and now it sucks. So I went there, and so did all of Little Saigon. Even though they didn't eat any of the stuff there, because who the hell would buy Bun Bao for like $20? For like three? I'm sorry. I can buy that for like 50 cents each. Or you know what? Even better. I can make it myself. I don't need to pay 20 bucks for that. Anyway, anyway. When you see that they're selling like pho for like $20 a bowl and you're like, child. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. No, but you see, they put in like the egg, they arrange it so it looks like it's a Mickey. It's like, child. No, no, no. <laughs> Sweetie, we're not doing this right. No. Anyway, one of the issues with exponential growth is it does require you to kind of sort of know what's going on with the population. You kind of need to know the starting point. So we have ways of figuring out what's the number to begin with. N naught, that's not what I hope to do. N naught is our starting point population. So you saw that it was right here. And not. So the population at any moment in time should be the starting population times e to the rt, so what, however the time units are, and the growth rate. These two statements are interchangeable. It's just a matter of what you're looking at. So when we want to calculate the actual population, we have two options to figure out what it really is. In reality, one of these is never done, even though we like the idea of doing it, but it's never done. 
option number one, outside of drawing scribbles everywhere, is let's count them all. That's option number one. You can literally go out and count everything for a particular population. We try to do that in the United States every 10 years. And it takes them three years to do it. And even then, they still give you a guess at the end because not everyone wants to be counted, the, which is, of course, the census. So what we do instead is we can do a modified version of what's known as mark and recapture. So what mark and recapture turns out to be is really easy, and it's a proportions game that has a whole bunch of assumptions in it. So what we do is we capture an initial number. We're going to mark them somehow. I'm then going to release them. I don't know why I wrote replace, because that, that's not a word. So we'll capture some initially, we'll mark them, we let them go. I mean, they're not doing that for the purposes of figuring out population, but that'd be a mark. It's a way of saying, this is a good one. She reproduces. Don't mess with her. Yeah, so that's a way of saying, don't, don't take this one. So it's for a different purpose, but it's like that. So capture, you put something on them, some type of tracker, notch their tail, spray paint something on them, whatever, as long as it's not toxic. Let them go. You wait a certain amount of time. Then what we have to do is we recapture a certain number. So we have number one and we have a certain number two. And then we're going to see what proportion has the marking. How would this work? This would be something like I have a hundred ants. I put a hundred red dots on them. I let the ants go. I'm going to recapture seventy five ants. That's not the word ants. Oop. And of those seventy five, one has a red dot. What I can do is make a guesstimate. Here's the guesstimate. I had 100 that I marked initially out of an unknown total. So this was my initial mark with an unknown total. assuming that they're not reproducing on me and they're not all dying on me or they're not leaving the area, they're kind of staying put and they're within an area that I can recapture, what I should expect to see is the equal proportion, which would be one that was marked. So this is a recapture mark compared to the 75 that were recaptured. Then all I have to do is solve for x. And what would I see in this case? x is 7,500. So we would say, off of our estimation, we are guessing that there is 7,500 ants in this area. Which is obviously ridiculous, because that number is way too small. But that's how we would do this. Would you rely on doing it once? Of course not. You would do this over and over and over and over again. And then you would average them, and then you could do statistics on that. There are some people who are gifted with their ears. And they can sometimes be sent out into forests, and they just listen for bird songs. And based upon the songs that they hear, and they can immediately pick out the different songs, 
they just do that, you know, a couple weekends a year or weekends a month, they can be used as proxy mark and recaptures. Just like, oh, how many times do you hear these songs? And it's a different way of doing a mark and recapture. There, you're just doing more of a direct sampling. This picture here has to do with the laborious version of all the counts. This here is a citation that you have probably never heard of before. And by the time uh, you all are my age, they will probably no longer exist. These are called vaquitas. They are found in one place and only one place on Earth, and that is the Gulf of California. Depending on which population study you trust, the number is somewhere between 9 and 20 on Earth. How big are they? Well, they're the world's tiniest of the cetaceans, meaning things that are porpoises or dolphins or whales. They're the smallest of them. How big? Um, hold on. I'll show you. About there. That's right. You can pick one up and go, it's mine, and swing them. We don't hunt them. They're just caught in fishing nets because they're the size of fish. And then they die in the fishing nets. Why do they have to do that? Because we've starved the populations that go that are at the top of the Gulf of California of water because we sucked it all out because we want water from the Colorado River. And the result is those fishing communities venture further out and they have basically accidentally hunted them to extinction. So it's their fault. No, it's our fault. Because we're living in an area where there shouldn't be water. But they, we know by direct counts. The problem is it's marking them like they're going extinct. Do you really want to sit there and like put tags on them? So that's why we have some discrepancy with the numbers. Oh, another one that's really easy to do. Uh, northern white rhinos. I know that one. The answer is two. And they're both female. They both have honor guards. They're both in, Ken they in Kenya or Uganda. They're in one of the two. They have 24-hour armed guards. So if you were to go near them without permission, uh, you will be shot dead. Even if you just want to sit there and take a photo of them, it won't matter. They're going to shoot you. Because the assumption is you're a poacher. They'll kill you. And they're both females. They're done for. The San Diego Zoo is working on, can we figure out a way to attempt to bring them back? Because we have samples from several dozen of them we have dna samples from several dozen of the northern white rhinos it's just poaching and just a lot of bad luck like males just dying even though they're young it's like oh well that sucks so what they're trying to do at the san diego zoo is figure out a way that you can take a southern white rhino which is genetically very 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 similar can we take one of their eggs hollow it out and then heck, take uh, you know, some type of tissue from one of the northern white rhinos, put it on in, so basically a somatic cell nuclear transfer, and then have that southern white rhino be a surrogate for a northern white rhino. Because will you get the northern white rhino coming out of it? No. But you're getting more than what's going to exist in a few decades. But no one's tried surrogacy with rhinos before. So they're having to figure out, can, you ha can we figure out how to get rhinos to be surrogates? And it's taken them a lot of money and a lot of time. They figured, out, figured it out with white rhinos. So now they're trying to build up to, are we ready to really try this with the northern white rhinos? And yeah. It's, it's a big story, but they get lots of money for it, so they're okay. The catch with all of this, the San Diego Zoo actually used to have two of them. They used to have a male and a female, northern white rhino. So I've seen northern white rhinos. 
and if have you all been to the safari park for the San Diego Zoo? One, two, three. The rest of you, you have no clue. You would know if you've been there because you go on like this train ride and it takes you around like a big old safari area and they have all sorts of animals that are just roaming around everywhere. So they used to have a male and a female. The male who was really young like died out of nowhere and they have no clue why because it had all the space it wanted. Uh, it freaked them out when it died because there was nothing that would have said that it, it should have happened. So their female was immediately, they're like, whatever's going on, we can't keep her here. So they said, no, she needs to go back. So she is one of the two who has an armed guard. And she will have an armed guard until she dies. But anyway. In reality, you don't get unlimited food, shelter, and space. Even your stupid duckweed does not get unlimited food, shelter, and space. At some point... They start to fester in their own filth. At some point, they've filled up all the space that they have. At some point, they've eaten all the food that's there. So we're going to run out of those resources. That could be a permanent issue. It could be a seasonal issue. What's then going to kick in is a control. We have two different versions of population control. One of those is what we call density-dependent. Density-dependent factors has all to do with how crowded are the conditions. So the crowds matter. The population density is important. The other option is density-independent, and that's where it, it doesn't matter how crowded it is. But the result is both of these will limit population growth. Which is a nice way, nice way of saying stop exponential growth. So Density dependent factors, the ones where how crowded you are turns out to be important. The way that this manifests is you're going to fight for the resources. If you fight, everyone loses. This is what we would call a negative, negative situation. Because everyone's going to get hurt, or you're going to use up energy, or you're spending time fighting for those resources when you could have been just consuming or using those resources. For you all, I didn't include these things, but so this type of symbolism, like the minus minus would be things like, if you think of a parasite, it's called a plus minus relationship. The parasite wins and you lose. Mutualism is where both of you benefit. Or you could have commensalism. That's when I told you that fun story about things living on your eyebrows. That one is one of them benefits and the other one's like, what? We just call that a zero. This weekend, for those of you who are going to be able to go, um, we're going to see some parasites when we're there. They have lots of mistletoe growing right now. If you've never seen mistletoe before in the wild. It's hard to miss. So you either have to be fighting or you're going to be trying to exploit each other. So try and get something else to give you those resources. So you're going to try and steal them. You might get some benefit out of it. So we are going to have all those interactions from last week. So exploit, you're going to eat things. You can mimic, benefit, everyone helps out. But there's another weird thing that happens. Disease shows up. Disease is a product of crowds.
Why is the wintertime cold in flu season? Because when it's wet outside, you get sick. That's what your mom tells you. Is that true? Part of it's true. When it's cold and when you're wet, you do your body temperature does depress, your immune responses weaken. For whatever reason, when you get cold, your body has a hard time fighting off disease. The other thing, when it's cold and wet, do you want to be outside? No, you go inside where all the other people who don't want to be outside huddle together. Well, when you're all trapped in the same spot and one person goes, achoo, everyone else stuck in that spot has to breathe in whatever came out with that achoo. And the result is, we can spread disease. When did we start seeing huge spreads of disease amongst humans? When we started making cities. And we started saying yes to agriculture. The result was, we all started piling into certain locations. And when we're all piling into those certain locations, it's easier for diseases to hop from person to person. The more crowded it gets, the easier it is to spread disease. Have you ever wondered why we have mosquitoes? Like, if God is all loving, why did he say yes to the mosquito? What do mosquitoes spread? disease. And what does disease do to populations? Drives it down. What good are mosquitoes? What's their niche? Population control. Without them, our population sizes would be worse. I mean, malaria alone wipes out half a million people each year. And if you look at the people infected, if we didn't have medicines to fight back, it'd be more like 10 million people a year that'd be wiping out. That's one disease spread by basically one type of mosquito. How many other diseases are there? I mean, you all know that um, COVID's still killing like two, 300 people a day. It hasn't disappeared. It's still killing quite a few people each week. It's just not making the news. Similar to this disease thing is this thing called the predator-prey cycle. I'm sure you've heard of the predator-prey cycle, which is saying that if you have an increase in the prey numbers, what that will allow is for an increase in the predator numbers. When you have lots of predators, they're going to eat all the prey. And the result is the prey numbers drop down because they're being eaten. But when you don't have any things to eat, then the predator numbers are going to drop down. But when you don't have any predators, that means the prey don't need to worry about getting eaten. So then their numbers go up again. But when there's a lot of prey, then the predators say, ooh, and they get to eat and reproduce. So then their numbers go up. But when you have a lot of those, it's going to drive down the prey numbers, which means eventually, uh-oh, there's nothing for the predators to eat. And then it just keeps cycling back and forth like this. Or something like that. You've heard of those, maybe, perhaps? Are they real-ish? There's more things that go on here than just that. Usually when we think of predator-prey cycles, what they target is the weak. And the diseased. Well, where do you see weak and diseased individuals? When you have a population of 10 or when you have a population of 1,000? Odds are you're going to see them in the large population than you will in the small population. The wolves take out the weak usually. And once the weak are taken out, then you go after the rest of the population. But it's not as simple as this, oh, there's more of them, so the predators eat more. 
and then it just kind of oscillates up and down because they typically are population control. Uh, I told you all that. Density independent factors. So this has nothing to do with how crowded it is. If it floods and you drown, it doesn't matter if you're in a population of 50 million or if you're in a population of six. Flood's a flood, and at last check, drowning is drowning. If we run out of food and water, it doesn't matter how big that city is, you're running out of food and water. If we freeze over, it doesn't matter how big the city is, you froze over. If we're all burning up, it doesn't matter how big it is, we're done for. Big space rock goes and hits and we go kaboom. Doesn't matter how many of us there are, it's still big space rock hitting and we go kaboom. These are all density independent. What are, what's in common with all these? We call these natural disasters. And how do you stop a natural disaster? You don't, because it's natural. And oh no, it's a disaster. So how do things really grow? We call that real growth logistic growth. And its equations are gross. There's no point in lying about it. This is the equation. Oh, shoot. I, I always remember I need to fix it, and then I never do. So it's differential equation. So how we describe its growth, if you look at it, there's one component that looks familiar. That part that I just boxed, that was exponential growth. This portion right here that's new in blue, this is what we would call the regulation component. What do we see? As n approaches k, so whatever k is, oh, k, like k strategists. Yes, like k strategists, as n approaches k, 1 minus n over k approaches 0. Huh. So as n approaches whatever k is, so if n and k are the same number, this ratio here is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. I don't care what, how big this number is, the most ginormousness number ever times zero is zero. K, it must mean, has something to do with the limit. K must have to be the limit of the growth. If you had nothing better to do, we can convert this equation to that equation. Well, this one. This one would be an awful, awful problem to give you. This one would suck because you have to do like partial fractions. And then you have to start making some substitutions. and It sucks. This, this one blows to solve. The other one, easy. This one, no, 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 no we don't need that. So here, in this data table here that they have, they tell you that K equals 1,500. So if you look, as we make the population size get closer and closer to that 1,500, they have the great rate of growth. We're just calling it a 1. But this factor here, so K minus N over K is the same thing as 1 minus N over K. They're the exact same statement. But you notice that it, as the closer we get that population to 1,500, that number, this ratio of k minus n over k, goes to zero, and then the growth rate approaches zero. How this looks in a graph is like this. 
So exponential growth just keeps on going. Logistic growth has a max. And we call that max the carrying capacity. which is symbolized as K. What is K? I don't know. I could tell you what it means, but what is the actual number? What is the number K for humans? Don't know. The way that you find K is to go past it. And like, how do you find the growth rate? You have to look backwards in time. The only way we can find K is go past it. And then you find out. It is the original F around and find out. Because what would happen if you exceed it? You have too many for the resources. The only option is die-offs. Mass numbers have to die, which will drive the number down. And then what you actually end up getting is this weird pattern here, where it starts to oscillate. So K, again, is this carrying capacity, which is the theoretical maximum. The problem is, since everything is always changing on us, it's really hard to say what the number is. It's primarily based on density-dependent factors. But what you notice in reality is it doesn't just go to that number. It kind of oscillates. This oscillation is what we call a dynamic equilibrium. Why point that out to you? Because dynamic equilibria is physiology. This bobbling back and forth that you see up here at the top, around where we think the carrying capacity is, this bubbling is called a dynamic equilibrium. And virtually all physiologic processes do this. So we're going to spend, once we're done with ecology, the rest of the semester dealing with this. This oscillation around some type of target. You don't hit the target, you just bob near it. Sometimes you go above and then, oh crap, go bring them up, no, we're too low, okay, bring it back up again. Up, no, now we're too high again. And you just kind of bob up and down near what the answer is, but you never get the answer. Which is basically what I just said here. What happens when you go above? Again, we get die-offs, and we have restricted population size. What will it be like when we hit this in a country or as a planet? It's going to be awful. It's going to be absolutely awful. I'm hoping I'm dead first, because it will be awful, awful. Because it won't be, oh, look. There's a few people who are starving. No, it will be, look, an entire country just starved to death. But it won't just be them. It will be a few others. And because of the way we behave, all the food seems to be in two spots on Earth, and the rest of the world gets to watch those two spots. At last check, having all the big boom-booms won't be enough. When the world says, you have the food and we don't, and we want it. I, I, I'd like to be dead before that, that happens. Because we're on the target list when that happens. This one's fast, yeah. So when we look at these populations, they show up in a few different ways, meaning how they look. That how they look is called a distribution. And there are three types of distributions. You can just randomly have groups of organisms. I could have 
equal spacing, or they could just be kind of clumped together. If I look at a clump, clumped space, clump groups usually have some reason for it. It could be because they're clonal, meaning all your offspring that are just like you are right where you are. So you just you get these little clumps of organisms. It could be because, oh, there's food there, and that's why everything's just crowding into that one spot. And why aren't they over there? Because there's no food there. Or there's no shelter, there's no space. So we get these random clumpings. It could be random, which is there's no pattern, there's no real explanation. If you've ever looked at wildflowers, they totally follow this. It's usually some type of pattern with wind or water. Random distributions are usually a plant thing. Best place to go see wildflowers? I've never done it. I want to. Death Valley. You go to the Badlands, or the Badwater, excuse me, which is the basin. It's supposedly for like two weeks just covered literally mile upon mile of wildflowers. If you go there now, and I want to do this, I don't know when I'm going to be able to, except that I think by the time I'm going to be able to, it's going to be gone. There's a lake at the bottom. So the entirety of Death Valley was a lake. Then it dried out. And it has to be a lake because it's the lowest point. There's nowhere else for the water to go. There's a patch of water that's there almost all year round. It is boiling hot water but it doesn't boil because of how salty it is. And there are snails that live in that water right at the, the stop off for where you can walk out to the lowest point in the United States. It's the second lowest point in the entire world. It's 284 feet below sea level. And if you, have any of you ever been to the bad water? Like this is the time of year to go. Don't, don't go in the summer, you're gonna die. But if you were to go there now and you were to walk out, you have to walk out quite a ways. You turn around and then you look at the mountains. You look up the mountain and you see a marker that says, here's the ocean. And it's, you look up to see where the ocean turns out to be. It's actually quite crazy when you're there as to how far down you are. The third lowest point in the entire world, the Salton Sea. If any of you have ever been to the Salton Sea. If you haven't been to the Salton Sea, don't go to the Salton Sea. It smells and everything's dead there. It's really gross. Anyway, uh, you can see the wildflowers. And you can see the lake that's there. It's not going to be there that much longer. The other option is uniform density. And this is usually some type of territory. Plants can sometimes do this because they'll attack each other. Uh, this is usually made famous by eucalyptus. The famous example of this are penguins. They have their space and they fight for it. And if you were to like push a penguin near one of the others, they attack like, no, no, my space. Even though they're all crowded in there, but no, 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 my circle. Not your circle, my circle. And some of them will attack the people who go near there too. Because no. Nope! Mine, not yours. Which one are we? Clumped, uniform, or random? Which are we? Which are human? We're uniform? Where does about 80% of the world's population live? Next to water. 80% of all of the humans, 8 billion people, live 80% of those 8 billion. So a big number, 6.4 billion out of 8 billion, live next to water, 
What is it? We're clumped. This is humans. In case you didn't know or think about it. Uh, I don't care about the allele. All this is, is uh, some plants are uh, bad neighbors and they kill off other plants. Like if you look at certain trees, if you look, there's never anything growing underneath the tree or where the roots are. That's not because we're trimming it out. It's because that tree is killing anything that wants to grow there. So trees can fight and be territorial too. So next time we're going to work about um, energy and nutrients. We're not going to do the cards. 